Yes. On the on the experiments on the experiments when we're uh, coding for standard deviation, do you just want the deviation between each average of each level? Uh, right. So no, no, no. So right. So uh, the standard deviation that I'm looking for is when you do cross validation, you run five or six rounds, yeah. five or six trials. Each of them will give you a different accuracy. Take, I want the average accuracy and the standard deviation of that level. So for each each run in that level, not all the levels together? No, not across. So for so the, the, the general situation is of uh, So in fact, this is a good point that you bring up. Cross-validation is uh, a, a great tool for discovering which setting is good. Uh, so for those of you who have not started uh, yet, this is, uh, I don't know what, how I can explain it, but uh, since you've already started, um, Basically, the situation is, let's say we are considering different, say, feature combinations, different learning algorithms, or uh, different feature sets, or something, and you want to dis discover what is a good one, and train a classifier, but you're not allowed to look at the test set. So what you do is you split the data into many pieces, you train on, a bu uh, like, let's say you split it into 10 pieces, you train on 9, test on the 10th, and you do this for all possible choices of the 10th piece. Now, you, that means that you get 10 different accuracies for a setting. Now you want to know what is the quality of that setting, you take the average of these accuracies. And the standard deviation tells you how much variance there is by, you know, just by choice of data. So for every depth of the tree, you sh so the, the question that this is asking is, what is a good depth to stop building, uh, you know, growing the tree, or height or depth or whatever. And uh, I don't, we don't know the answer up front, so you try different things and you evaluate each one by using cross validation. And you get the variance of that depth by, sorry, you get the quality of that uh, depth, that setting by looking at the average cross validation accuracy, you get the, uh, how influenced is this choice of hyperparameter by randomness that you can get by the standard deviation. So you just want the actual standard deviation value itself, how yes. many percentage difference? Yes, okay. plus or minus something. Okay. Other questions? So those of you who have not seen this yet, uh, <coughs> cross-validation is important. I encourage you to start this early and keep going because uh, it's something that we will use in many homeworks and it's something that I hope you will use in life uh, because uh, it's an important technique that is more, that's a bit <coughs> boring to teach but it's important to learn. Uh, so it and it you need to learn by doing. Uh, and this is only the first time you'll see cross validation. You'll see cross validation pretty much in every programming homework. And I hope you, in fact, I insist that you do cross validation in your project as well. Other uh, questions about the homework? Just sort of curiosity. Uh, yes. Yes, it is. It is the hyper. We'll, uh, we'll be talking about uh, that very briefly today. So, uh, so just out of curiosity, how many, uh, how many people think this homework is too long or too short? Which one? <laughs> Good question. Uh, let's say too long. Not enough. Okay, so I can. Uh, okay. <laughs> Come on. <bro. laughs> again, again, again. <laughs> so the the reason I ask you this is. Uh, on an average, your homeworks will involve this amount of work. Uh, some of them will be a lot more uh, on paper work, more math, more theory, less practice. Some of them will be more uh, programming, less theory, but it will always be roughly this much amount of work. Um, and that's what it is. <laughs> um, but if you do have questions, please take advantage of office hours. We are there to try to help you. Um, so I can tell you that I'm a my favorite discussions in previous incarnations of the class have occurred in office hours. Uh, and I've heard similar such feed, uh, feedback from my TAs in the past as well. So please do take advantage of the office hours. Uh, another question, another announcement is about projects. Uh, it's early enough in the semester, but uh, there is a deadline coming up. You guys need to tell me your project team information. 
and this would be a good opportunity for me to tell you about the project. This year I'm planning to try out something new, uh, which is each of you can either do a class project, which, is, which means that you will form a team of one or two people and uh, you'll apply something that you've learned in the class on something <coughs> else, something that you think is not part of the class. And it should be at least harder than your homework. So more effort than your homework because it's a solid uh, one-fourth of your grade. And there are many, many, de uh, uh, what do you call it, many deadlines along the way. The first one is, uh, I just updated the date. It used to be this Thursday, but I've updated it to next Thursday. You have to tell me the uh, team information. You should tell me whom you're working with in the project. You could say I'm doing it alone, or you could say I'm doing it with another person, and that person's name. So let's call this the regular class project. Uh, this is your uh, something that you will uh, you know, work on. It will pick the problem. You'll write a pro project proposal. It will be something that you care about, hopefully. It will be something that you will convince me is interesting and something that I can learn something from. Uh, you'll write an intermediate report, you know, maybe a couple of weeks after the fall break is over, uh, telling me how the progress is. And you'll be graded on all this. And at the end of the semester, you'll write a report uh, telling me how wonderfully or how terribly it went. And one of the things I'm looking for in a good project is you should apply something that you learn in the class. It could be, for example, here's a new learning protocol that I think is interesting and I'm studying it from a theoretical point of view. I'm going to prove a theorem and uh, that's what it is. <coughs> I've had one or two theory projects in the past, every semester, and they tend to be somewhat harder because they tend to be uh, favor people who are already working on some work, something involved with theory tend to favor them, or people from math, for example. Um, another kind of a project could be, here is an interesting data set where I don't know the answer, it's something from the real world. Could be, for example, predicting, uh, you know, taking up the Netflix challenge. Given a collection of movies for a person, will that person like another movie or not? And you try out uh, various learning algorithms that you may have learned and extensions of learning algorithms that you've seen here on that data. And if it's a programming, if it's an experimental project, I insist, absolutely insist, that you must follow perfect experimental protocols. Uh, in the sense that you should, for example, use cross-validation, you should understand cross-validation. And I, in the past, I've been a little lenient about it, but this semester, I'm going to actually take off points for people who are not doing good experiments in the project. Because I've been told that uh, people are, it's a lesson that people are not learning, uh, and it's something that is crucial. So, for example, not looking at the test set, proper evaluation giving the same reasons for why this classifier worked or failed, or at least hypothesizing reasons for that. <coughs> Doing cross-validation, picking a wide enough uh, you know, set of hyperparameters to search from. Doing a reasonable feature, feature exploration, because we are now talking about <coughs> a problem where maybe you don't have features, maybe you don't even know what the features of the problem are. So you have to invent features. And it has to be more than just, you know, I just I downloaded a data set from Kaggle, I ran Perceptron, and I get 63% accuracy, that's my project, done. Uh, that is actually less work than your homework, so <laughs> don't embarrass yourself. Uh, that is, let's call that the regular project, that's option one. This year, as I said, as I said uh, I'm going to try something new. You have another option, which is the competitive project, where we will assign, the TAs and I, we will assign a data set, <laughs> we'll set up a Kaggle-like system for the class, <coughs> and you can, as the semester goes along, you will be implementing, running experiments on the same data set and submitting your, uploading your uh, results to that website, and you'll be placed on a leaderboard. <coughs> you'll be competing against each other, I mean, among those people who chose the competitive option. And uh, the hope is that in the, if you choose this option, again, I expect perfect experimental protocol, you still have to write a report, your intermediate <coughs> has to tell me you should have tried out at least two or three uh, algorithms by the time your intermediate report is due, and you should tell me what you've done. And when the semester is done, you write a report, you tell me how interesting the data set was, and you kind of tell me what you did 
how it worked, what you thought was, uh, you know, what you learned from the project. Really, that's the point. The goal of the project is for you to show me what you learned. So you can tell me what you learned from the project, you can tell me uh, what are the difficulties that you faced with the data, I don't really care about other things. Um, and uh, in some sense, it is very similar to the other project, except here you will see how you are ranked against each other, publicly, or you know, locally publicly. So, when you tell me the project, uh, you know, when you, uh, by September 15th, that is next Thursday, you should tell me one of two things. You should tell me, I want to be, I want to be, I'll be doing a regular project or a competitive project. If you're doing a regular project, you have to tell me your team information. Am I doing it by myself or with another person? And if so, who it is? If you're doing your competitive project, you're doing it by yourself. There is no team. Okay? Are the options clear? Yes. Is there a prize for the winner? <laughs> I can make that happen if necessary. <laughs> uh, yes. Are you graded based on where you are on the leaderboard? <laughs> you know, I am a little averse to doing that. Okay. Uh, partly because sometimes you just, things don't work. On the other hand, consider the following situation. Uh, and you know, I'm trying to be reasonable here. So let's say, 15 people choose to do the complicated project. And it just so happens that 14 of them use the decision tree algorithm. In fact, you literally just run homework one on that data set. And uh, out of the 14 who do decision trees, 13 get 88%, one of them gets 12%. Or let's say one of them gets 50%. Something is wrong. Right? So I will, if there's like a big jump from the mean, I will. Uh, I will take some points off. Uh, there is some reward for activity, but there is more reward for achievement. But on the other hand, if you get 15% get, you know, if uh, like uh, a majority of the people get uh, uh, 88%, and let's say you get 87, they are the same. I don't care. If it's a big jump, then there should be. So I, I, I the, and that's why the leaderboard does not reflect it. The leaderboard is just a ranking. I, I'm looking for big deviations. And in some sense, the leaderboard will tell you where you are up front. So it tells you that you've got a bug in your code, maybe. And this is something that we are trying out. Uh, Kaggle has a uh, software that we can actually run, and my TAs assure me they are going to figure it out. Uh, we are going to try to find an interesting data set. I've already been talking to one of the other faculty in the CS department, and uh, I'm, trying, I'm canvassing people for interesting data sets that they care about, uh, that are actually real life research problems, not just you know predicting the number of cars on Salt Lake City roads, but something more computer sciencey. Uh, and you, I'll keep you updated on that. All you have to do right now is think about which option you want to do, either the regular or the competitive. Remember the regular project is solo, so you're doing it by yourself, sorry, the competitive project is solo, you're doing it by yourself. Uh, the regular project is, you have the option of not, uh, uh, you know, of having a team of up to two people. <coughs> In both cases, you submit me, the, you submit the same set of reports, there's a, uh, you don't have a project proposal if you're doing this, uh, or you know, you, you can do a project proposal in both cases. You have an intermediate report and a final report. The final report will be graded in a similar way as if, you know, I, I look for experimental correctness, I look for uh, the rigorousness of your work. And uh, for the competitive part, there's the added fun of, you know, having a competition, maybe a prize, maybe not, I don't know, maybe, maybe let's say a prize. Yes. So will the data set be released before the deadline? Of course it will. Uh, not the test set. This but is going to simulate real life in the sense that you don't know what the test set is. Yes. Uh, in competitive one, uh, will it be possible for resubmissions like which since you don't know the test set, will it be possible? I will try to restrict the number of resubmissions because what will happen, and this is actually an interesting question. Uh, let's say you resubmit and you get feedback, and you write an API that submits to Kaggle, gets the feedback, and uses the error as signal to retrain your classifier. <laughs> You're laughing. Actually, someone did that. 
uh, a, a team that I'm not going to name, <coughs> headed by a famous researcher that I'm not going to name, did that for a competition. It got ugly uh, because the people who organized the competition found out. It made the New York Times. Uh, many people were fired. High profile jobs were, were lost. And uh, so, and the answer to that has become, you know, you limit the number of submissions. So I don't want you to train on the test set by using Canvas <coughs> as your oracle. It's doable if you are kind of uh, clever enough and you know, in, a, in a particular kind of a way you can do it. Uh, but please don't do that. That's kind of beating the point. But uh, I, so for that reason, I will restrict the number of submissions, but not so few that you know, you are not going to get anything. That will be for each of the uh, mini project thing. Right? Like it's, we'll be it's, uh, running multiple... Uh, it's learning algorithm. Sort yeah. Of. yeah, I'll figure out something. I, I, I'll try to give you some reasonable uh, benefit of doubt. Uh, we still have to figure out how the uh, Kaggle API works, so... Um, we'll work it out. But uh, it will be something that you won't be unhappy about. Alright, so the, if there are no other questions about such fun things like project, let's get back to the lecture. Uh, that, that's like your last call for questions. No, okay. Uh, for those of you who came in late, just two announcements that took all this time. Wow, 20 minutes. Uh, homework one is due next week. Uh, please start if you've not started yet. Uh, and there is a whole discussion about projects. Either you can do a regular project or a competitive project. If you're doing a regular project, you can do it by yourself or with another partner. If you're doing a competitive project, you're competing against the class on a data set that I provide. Alright, so we were in the middle of the de decision trees lecture, and uh, in fact, we were talking about overfitting. And this is an important concept that you should internalize. Uh, in, in a very loose sense, overfitting is what is said to happen when the data set learns the noise and fits the noise in the training set and that's why it, general, it does not generalize well enough on future examples. A formal, exam, a formal uh, definition that uh, is based on Watson Mitchell says, uh, uh, it goes like this. Suppose your data, both the inputs and the labels are drawn from a distribution, an unknown distribution, you don't care what it is at this point. And there is a hypothesis space H here, and you train your classifier. Now, there are two kinds of errors that exist. Only one of them is measurable. The first one is called the training error. So you train it for any hypothesis. The training error is the error of that hypothesis on the training set. It's very easy to do. You just, you have a function, you predict on all the training examples. You see how, what fraction of them it uh, disagrees on with the label. That's your training error. The true error is the error of the classifier <coughs> is the expected error of the classifier on future examples. Okay? So the way the true expectation works is you draw a random sample from the true distribution, you evaluate your hypothesis on that example, and uh, the expectation of that error is the true error. You can't measure the true error because we don't have the true distribution, we don't have every example that can exist. <coughs> now, given these two concepts, overfitting is defined as the following situation. Let's say you're learning algorithm. Uh, or let's say you have a hypothesis H, and that's the one that your learning algorithm claims is the best one according to its internal measure, according <coughs> to its uh, calibration. And the, it finds the hypothesis H, and there's another hypothesis H prime. H prime has <coughs> higher training error. Meaning, in terms of its uh, performance on the training set, H is clearly better. On the other hand, H prime has lower generalization error. Even though according to this <coughs> training set, the hypothesis H is better, in general, 
the hypothesis H prime is better. This could happen when, say for example, the training set has noise. And so you fit the noise. But in general, the, the noise may, it may, may be random. So it does not exist or it's different. Any questions about uh, this, this <coughs> definition of overfitting? Uh, how practical is this definition? So you might always find like supposing a hypothesis like the time is yeah, that's a good question. How practical is this uh, definition? We don't have any, we don't have a, the error D, first of all, right? This is just a definition of concept. What we'll see eventually is we will use this definition to actually give us learning algorithms that don't try to minimize training error, but try to minimize some surrogate for this quantity, for error on the future. Which means you have to make some assumptions about the future. And that's a big part of uh, what, uh, say for example, a whole family of learning algorithms called loss minimization algorithm. You try to make some assumption about the future and hope that your assumptions are right and you minimize, you find a hypothesis that generalizes better. But from, here's a, uh, this, this is one such study uh, of, you know, classic picture of uh, overfitting. The dotted line is the test error, the error on the test set. So by the way, error on error D, which is the error that's based on the true distribution of the data, is impossible to calculate. On the other hand, you do have a test set. And the test set is your surrogate for the future. It's your surrogate for the true distribution. And you can measure average error on the test set and use that as a way of measuring generalization. This is why the test set should never be looked at. So here you have two curves. Let's take the solid curve that's going on top. First of all, what is happening here? On this axis, you're allowing, on some data set, you're allowing the decision tree to become bigger and bigger. You're, so for example, to get the point, the point here, what you did was, to get this point, let's say this is 18, what you did was, you grew your decision tree to depth 18, at that point, after that uh, 18, after the height of the tree is 18, you don't add any more nodes. You just take the majority label and you say, I'm not going to grow the tree anymore. And that has some training error, right? Because it's not going to fit the data perfectly. Remember, decision trees fit the training set perfectly, but because you're not allowing the tree to grow fully, you're actually going to introduce some training error. So that's why this is, that explains this bit. And this depth also has a test error, which is slightly more. Actually, here there's accuracy. This axis accuracy. I use error and accuracy, uh, you know, in, in place of each other. <coughs> one of them is one minus the other. So, using the word, the notation here, this tree here at depth 18 has a certain training uh, accuracy, which is the height of this thing, point here. And it has a certain test accuracy. And typically, the test accuracy is lower than the training accuracy. Often. Not always, but often. And the reason for that is, you know, you're, you're seeing unseen examples, so you can't have to do as well. What is happening here is, as you're allowing the depth of the tree to get higher and higher, you know, to more and more, you see that the decision, the training accuracy keeps increasing. What that means is you're fitting the, basically, that if, if the depth is allowed to grow to infinity, this will, what will the accuracy be? 100%. One. It has to, you know, fit the data. If there's no noise in the data, assuming. So, by the way, that's a big assumption. I mean, real life data always has noise. Uh, I mean, it might have contradictions. That's, uh, let's ignore that for now. So, the training accuracy keeps getting higher and higher, and we expect that. That's what we, you know, that's what uh, our knowledge of decision trees tells us. What is interesting is as you grow the tree more and more, the test goes down. What that means is, and it kind of seems to average out around here, around 70% or less than that. So what's going on is, as the tree gets larger and larger, what you're doing is overfitting. So this is a classic picture for overfitting. When the training error is so much more than the test error. And 
here this hype, this parameter here is called the hype, it's a hyperparameter, it's the size of the tree. Oh, it's the number of nodes, not even the depth, but it doesn't matter. So it's the size of the tree and this is something that you can control. Now, here we are presented with a choice. We need to figure out what is a good hyperparameter, what's a good size to stop. Can someone give me a suggestion? For this picture, how do you stop, know what's a good height to pick? If this is the picture that you see. Uh, when the, <coughs> when yes. the you could give a weighted average of the train and test sets and then just maximize that function. But we, no, no, no I, I'm not asking for how as in an algorithm. <coughs> which, uh, which of these sizes would you pick? Would you pick a size 90? Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you pick a size I would probably pick something around here, right? Something around here, right? <coughs> Somewhere around here. And uh, our hope is that we somehow discover this point without having to use the test set. And that's why cross validation is useful. You simulate a test set <coughs> by chopping up the training set and training in different ways, and the cross validation accuracy is a surrogate for this test accuracy. And you will see this kind of a picture very often, where the cross-validation accuracy as you change the hyperparameter first goes up and then comes down. And the, because on one side you have overfitting, on the other side you have something about underfitting, we'll get to that later. Uh, and with somewhere in the middle is a sweet spot. And finding the sweet spot is hyperparameter search. That's what you're doing in your homework as well. Any questions about uh, this idea? Yes. So which is most desirable here? To set the size of the tree such that the accuracy of the, on the training data and the test data is the same or to maximize the accuracy on the test data? The game is always to maximize the accuracy on the test set. Because that is the only thing we care about. Generalization accuracy is all we care about. I really don't care about your performance on the training set because you have the training set. Think about it. Think about uh, it this way. Suppose you have, you suppose I have a training set, and then you give me an example to predict, and then I see that it's exactly the same as something in the training set. Would I even have to run the classifier? No, I just look it up, and I can get 100% accuracy on the training set just because I remember all the examples. So learning is not memorizing, and in order to test learning, you need to test on other things, and that's all we care. About. Yes, are you? Necessarily looking for the smallest size that will maximize that, like no, we, 10 over 20 all the time? Me? Uh, actually, oh, you mean if they are all equal? Yeah. They're, if they are all equal, fun. then you have to introduce some other knowledge about the problem that you have. Uh, in this case, I would pick a smaller tree because they tend to be more general. Uh, but in some other cases, I would just <coughs> pick whichever. In fact, when in, in most of my research, I just automate this process. I just if they are all equal, I take the ra a random one, uh, and I hardly ever use decision trees in my research. But that's just me. And then what about like if the instead of going down the accuracy, just kind of still slopes up a very very slight bit on the training or on the on the test set. That means you've not uh, <coughs> instead of call, calling it test set, let's call it cross validation accuracy because the average cross validation accuracy is surrogate. So. If that happens, that means you've not explored the space of hyperparameter. <coughs> Eventually, you will overfit. Because think of the number of this, the, this uh, hyperparameter as some sort of a representational capacity of the classifier. If you give it enough capacity to represent everything, you will just remember the training set. Which means you will overfit the training set, which means the test accuracy is going to drop. So, that just means that you've not explored the hyperparameter space sufficiently. That's a good point, actually, and something that is often, it's a subtle question, it's a subtle thing. Yes, that's a good question. Yes? So, I'm kind of struggling with this. If if you have more nodes, doesn't that mean you are testing all the functions? If you could test everything, then you would know? <coughs> no, no, no. So, the, imagine the nodes, the, instead of nodes of the decision tree, think, for example, uh, let's think about how the node of the decision tree, uh, what the node of the decision tree means. Every node of the decision tree is a test. It's a test for some features. Is this feature taking this value? Right? 
Now let's say I have a feature in my tree that says what is, uh, let's say, let, remove the tennis data. Uh, I want to decide whether I want to, I have to decide whether I have to play tennis or not. Let's say I have, a, in addition to the features that we had, I have one more which is, um, let's say, the, we are talking about the weather, right? So, the time of the day when a blue car crosses my front door. That's a feature. I can measure it. It may not have anything to do with tennis, but you know, it's definitely a feature. And if that node gets inserted in this tree, it's going to introduce noise. So adding unnecessary extra nodes often correlates with noise. So the hope here is by pruning the tree, you prune away the uninformative pieces first. Or by that's why we grow the tree by adding the most informative pieces first. And then by not growing it further, you don't add what might be noise. So the size of the that's why the size of the tree correlates with uh, generalization. We are not we may be adding extra information. Sure, there may be this very subtle uh, feature that is often important but is overlooked. But if it's so subtle, then it's not informative enough. Really selecting the right feature set or in this game, in this in, 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 in this learning algorithm, yes. Uh, for other learning algorithms, the hyperparameter may mean other things. Uh, in, in some sense, it's actually not selecting the feature set; it's selecting something that we could call the capacity of the classifier, the representational capacity. What concepts can it represent? And we'll formalize this idea of a capacity when we come to learning theory. But for now, you can think of it as what are the sets of functions that this that trees with uh, 18 nodes can represent. Clearly, there are more functions with 30 nodes than with 18 nodes. <coughs> so your search space is bigger, so there's more noisy functions that you can accidentally pick. Yes? So if you decide to divide your data into like multiple sets, is it possible for like the algorithm to like result in very different... Like, in fact, it could. That's why you do that's why you do cross validation. If you divide the data into two parts and test on, train on one and test on the other, then you can actually end up fitting the noise in the training bit. But if you do cross validation, you have multiple such pieces. The same set, you divide into say five parts, train on part one, two, three, four, test on five, train on one, two, three, five, test on four, test on three, test on two, and test on one. You get five different accuracies. And the average is a robust estimator of the test error. Alright, let's move on. How do you avoid overfitting in decision trees? We've kind of uh, touched upon this already multiple times. One approach is to fix the height of the tree. Uh, an extreme of the uh, uh, extreme idea here is called a decision stump, where you fix the height of the tree to one. You basically get <coughs> one level down. And decision stumps are by themselves going to be terrible. Basically, you're asking one question or two questions at most. But uh, decision stumps are very useful. In fact, uh, I will uh, come back to decision stumps later when we talk about ensembles because it's even though a decision stump is often bad, a committee of decision stumps tends to be very good. You train many, many decision stumps by randomly selecting uh, subsets of the data and you average out the result. You allow, give each of them a vote and the voted decision stumps tend to be a fairly uh, good classifier in general, uh, in, in, in many cases. Another uh, example is again something that we have been talking about. You split the data into a training set and a held out set. You grow your tree on the training set and you check how good is it on the held out set. Um, and you stop growing when the held out performance kind of peaks out. A, a more robust version of this is cross validation, which I just described. Another uh, way of thinking about it is you grow the tree all the way down, you make the biggest tree possible and then you do some pruning. You start, you know, uh, prune some branches and you again, you use like a held out set or a validation set to decide which branches to prune. This is not, th there are many, many uh, games that one can play here. We won't be touching on this, I just want you to be aware of this idea. Again, this, this, the principle here is the same, smaller trees are better. And so you grow the tree and then somehow make it smaller later. Uh, one way of doing this is actually pretty neat. 
uh, remember that every decision tree can be seen as a collection of rules. And I think I may have some. So yeah, this tree here <coughs> is a collection of rules, right? If the color is blue and the shape is a triangle, then the output is a B. If the color is red, then the output is a B, and so on. I can write it as just a bunch of rules. And instead of pruning uh, nodes or pruning edges, you start pruning rules <coughs> by using various uh, heuristics. And some of the decision tree software libraries out there uh, tend to do this. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, how do you prune the rules? Uh, do we just remove the rules from uh, uh, the feature space? You, no, the, the, the rules are not part of the feature space, right? The rules are the classifier. You, there are various ways you go through, you take each rule and you ask, is this rule really giving me more, much more? Compare with and without. And if it's not giving more, uh, a lot of information, you can throw it out. Or you can uh, use a validation set for comparing with and without a rule. And the goal here is to find a subset of the rules that together are a good classifier. Yes. So a rule would just be a full path from the... Yes. Okay. Yeah. So how do you remove a full path? Just the last part of it or... No, at the end, you're not guaranteed that the output's a tree anymore if you do this. Right? Yeah. So the, that's why this is like a compiling process. You take a decision tree, do some pruning, and you get another object <coughs> that is not really a tree, it is just a bunch of rules. Okay. Uh, did you have did you have an extension to your question? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, same thing. All right. So uh, I think yes. Maybe I missed you said this, but um, how do you avoid once you build a, a, a complete tree? Yeah. Uh, using the, whatever uh, um, algorithm that you choose, uh, and then you start pruning. How do you avoid the circumstance where you now? Um, have data. Oh, you have to have backup uh, backup rules. By doing that, you need to say if the, if then it becomes like the L <coughs> condition at the bottom of an if thing. You need to have that in place. Otherwise, you might end up with an example that does not fit any of these things. Yes, so that's actually a good point. Uh, that's a very that's like one of those edge cases that often gets forgotten. You have half a hand raised up. Is that a question? <laughs> Alright, so let's uh, wind up. Decision trees are fairly popular and they represent any Boolean functions and prediction is actually very easy. Um, we saw one greedy heuristic for learning a decision tree, the ID3 algorithm. It turns out there are many robust implementations of this and variants of this. There's something you will see. You may come across something called C4.5, you may come across something called CART. There's an entire book on CART. Uh, and CART uses decision trees not just for classification but also for regression. We didn't touch upon regression yet. Um, decision trees can be pro uh, prone to overfitting unless you take some extra steps to avoid it. And one of the nicest things about decision trees, and this is one place where they, one of the reasons why they refuse to die, <coughs> is decision trees give us some are some of the probably the most interpretable classifier. Because, you know, I can just look at the tree and I know why the decision was made. I can explain the decision of a classifier with a decision <coughs> tree better than any other things. If you have, uh, we'll see other classifiers later, you know, linear type classifiers which we are going to start in a bit. Or we can see, uh, eventually we'll touch upon neural networks. These are opaque boxes. We cannot explain. The classifier can give a label, but it will not tell us why it gave a label. But because decision trees have this map, decision trees have this one-to-one -one correspondence <coughs> with the rules, they tend to be some of the best ex in terms of explainable, uh, in terms of being explainable. Which is why you will uh, the decision trees often find favor with uh, in cases where you want to not just make a prediction but also give a reason for why you made that prediction. All right, so let's. Stop decision trees for the rest of the semester, except when we'll come back to it uh, with ensembles. There's a question. So, would it be fair to generalize in that like, inaccuracy in the models is mostly due to like, either the model losing information or because of noise? For example, like the. Could be both, actually. Could be, it could be both. It's hard to tell. Um, 
and uh, it could be because the problem itself has so much noise that it is an unlearnable problem. Or it could be that you don't have the right features. It could be your overfitting, it could be your underfitting, because we are dealing with making predictions about the future. So it's never, on real data it's impossible to tell, which is why it's important to have a domain expert in the game. If you are working on discovering a drug for some disease, it's good to talk to a biologist once in a while. <coughs> because they'll give you domain information, they'll kind of guide you away from you know, features that you think might be important but are actually irrelevant, for example. But like, say for example, if like, there's no loss at all, you only have relevant data. Okay. Is it still possible to like, overfit the same tree? Sure. If you, uh, let's see, you, you, so the question is you're saying there is no noise in your data at all, ever, both in the training set and the future. Is it possible to overfit on a decision tree? Um, it's possible to underfit actually, because you might learn a function that is correct but not the right, that agrees with the training set but not with, but is not the true function because you've only seen a small sample. So you don't have the information to build it. So that might be a reason why you're making an error. Alright, so with this fun adventure, now let's continue with the uh, Move to, uh, let's move to linear models. We are going to have, we are going to do a long stretch through linear models. I'll start with linear models today. Just keep the date. It's September 6th, and we'll probably end in November. Uh, in between, I will do some DV. I'll go, uh, you know, through some variants, some non-linear classifiers, kernels, and uh, neural networks and stuff, which are all non-linear, but. The underlying machinery that we will use will be very similar to what we see in linear models. So this is like probably the most dominant family of classifiers out there. So it's important to understand them both algorithmically, geometrically, uh, and also from the point of view of their uh, representative power, what kind of functions they can capture. So just as a checkpoint, where are we? We are and will be for a very long time in the domain of supervised learning. We have instances that need, that need to be classified and our goal is to mimic a concept function, or to an oracle, and we will frame learning as a search over a hypothesis space. And the uh, you know, black box picture of it looks like you have some labeled data that gets fed into a learning algorithm. The learning algorithm spits out what is called a hypothesis. I'll also use the word model for this, the learning algorithm gives you a model, and then a new example comes in, you use the learned model, and you, give a, you get a prediction, and that's how you make money. Uh, we looked at one learning algorithm, <coughs> the decision tree learning algorithm, but we'll see a whole bunch more by the time we are done. And we've already seen two important uh, general machine learning ideas, which keep coming up all over the place. One of them is the idea of features being high dimensional vectors, we saw that very early on, and just now we had this whole discussion on overfitting. Are there any questions about the big picture, about where we are? Good. This lecture is, uh, I say this lecture, but really this, let's call this chapter, is about linear classifiers. And uh, we'll start off with what are linear classifiers and we look at what kinds of boolean functions they can express because we looked at boolean functions before right conjunctions and things we'll see are linear classifiers capable of doing boolean functions and if so which ones and then we'll go on a little detour from classification onto regression because some of you may have seen linear regression and if you if not this could be a good opportunity for you to learn linear regression and linear regression, in the process of looking at linear regression, we look at the idea of learning as optimization because that's an important uh, general concept. And again, we'll, at the end of it, we'll come back to linear classifiers and I'll give you like a big picture of what's going on with linear classifiers and where we are. So let's start with linear classifiers. We look, we've looked at this before and I argued that learning is impossible unless you make some assumptions because the number of possible functions is so large that you can never possibly uh, hope to generalize. And the only 
reason we have any hope is this assumption of regularity. The universe has some regularity and we are trying to capture it. And one way we are trying to capture the regularity is by making an assumption. By restricting the search space for the learner, by picking a hypothesis space that is smaller than the set of all functions. This inductive bias lets the learning algorithm uh, generalize by hope, hopefully finding an easy function. Basically what we are saying is that learning works when learning works. Uh, that's not saying much, but uh, we'll try to say that in a learning works when learning works plus epsilon kind of way later. Uh, among the functions that we looked at, we looked at simple conjunctions, we looked at uh, disjunctions, we, or at least I mentioned disjunctions, we looked at these m of n rules. Today we look at linear functions. Now, before getting into linear functions, I'm going to show you two classifiers. Suppose this is your training set. You need to somehow find a way to separate in this space, separate out the triangles from the circles. This one clearly separates them out. This one, not so much. Let's call them A and B. And you know, just to make it clear, that side of both of them is blue and this side uh, is red and this side is blue. So now, the question is, which of these is better? And when you answer that question, I want you to think about overfitting. B is better. How many people say B is better? How many people say A is better? One person. How many people did not raise their hands? This could be your opportunity. Excellent. So, a majority think B is better. One person says A is better. And do you want to justify it or do you want to... Or are you just saying it just so that the, both sides have votes? <laughs> you don't know. Okay. Um, B is better in the following sense. If I were to argue that B is better, I'm going to argue that A is better, but if I were to argue that B is better, what I would argue is, look at this picture. It separates out every uh, blue dot from every red triangle. So B clearly has zero training error. No. Sorry, A. A, my bad. A clearly has, thank you for being awake. A clearly has zero training error. So A is perfect. Is A even possible using machine learning? Uh, you know. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, A. But even if A were possible using machine learning, would I even want it? I would not want it because it runs the risk of overfitting. Let's say that I add a new training example. Let's go back a bit. Let's say I add a new training example. Let's say I put uh, a triangle here. Now, the algorithm that found the curve, what it should do is something like this. <coughs> now, let's say another training example comes in and it looks like this. There is a, I'm going to draw a circle, there's a, it, assume that that's blue. <laughs> now it should do something way more messy. Right? So, basically you're trying to fit every nook and cranny of the data, which means you're guaranteed to fit the noise. And, which is why uh, linear classifiers are, so this is one reason for <clears throat> arguing for simplicity, over just training accuracy. Okay, I've not made any formal arguments yet, I'm just appealing to emotion. Simplicity is better. A similar kind of an argument holds for regression. We've not touched upon regression, so here's an opportunity. Regression is the problem of predicting not a decision, true or false or something like that, but a real number. So, you can call it curve fitting. I can fit this curve. Or, I can do this. And once again, I would argue that line B, the line is better than the curve. If you have a finite number of points, and if you pick a high enough polynomial, you can fit any data, perfect. So, just fitting the data is not a good enough um, uh, requirement. All what we care about is generalization and simplicity and simpler hypotheses, hopefully in this kind of proof by pictures way, 
generalize better. And let's look at, and this is the, a very, uh, of, uh, what do you call it, hand wavy argument for linear models, both classifiers and regressors. Um, we will look at more formal arguments later, but the, you will never come across an argument that says, this is why we need to take this hypothesis space of linear classifier. You just get, I think linear classifiers are better because they are simpler. I think linear classifiers are better because they are easier to learn and things like that. We, there will be one place where we will see a formal argument for why linear classifiers are better, but that's not now. So, I've said linear classifier so many times, I think it's about time I define it. Uh, in this world, for now, and for a while from now, we'll be looking at inputs as n-dimensional vectors. How many people have seen the idea of n-dimensional vector spaces before? And how many people are uncomfortable with the idea of n-dimensional vector spaces? You could have seen it and still be uncomfortable. <laughs> I can tell you that for the longest time after I saw n-dimensional vectors, it was just so wrong. It did not feel right. It took me some time for me to get used to it. So, uh, if you're uncomfortable, work through the algebra first and then try to build up intuition. The one thing you should be wary of is uh, be wary of any proof by pictures once we come to n dimensional space. Trust pictures less than your algebra. So, inputs are n dimensional vectors, and what are these vectors? These are feature vectors. There is some feature extraction process that has created these vectors for us. And our goal is to take these n-dimensional vectors and label them. Uh, for now, we'll only be looking at binary classif classification, and so the labels are either plus ones and minus ones. Sometimes I'll use one and minus one for true and false, sometimes I'll use one and zero for true and false, and often the context will make it clear. So in this slide, the false is minus one. A linear threshold unit is a device that takes an example of this kind, and classifies it by using this rule. I'll tell you the geometry of this rule in a bit, but it is a linear threshold unit is defined by a weight vector w and something called a bias. This is also this is called a bias. A bias. And what it does is it, when the example comes in, you take the example, take a dot product of the example with the weight vector, add the bias. And if that whole thing is positive, you say plus 1. If the whole thing is negative, you say minus 1. So you take the sign of the bias plus the dot product. So if, if the mechanics of it, in, in a very stark algebraic way, if the mechanics of it clear. All you do is when an example comes in, you take a dot product, add a bias, and look at the sign of that score. Yes. So we're projecting it. Um, Geometrically, you are making a projection. So in fact, so let's look at, you can, you can think of this as a projection onto the line, uh, or another way of thinking about it is uh, from the point of view of half spaces. So I told you do not trust pictures when it comes to n-dimensional spaces, and then I show you a picture. With, uh, this. Uh, this is one of the few pictures where it actually captures reality. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just trying to make, like, clarify that there. So with our, with our line, um, you, you're making your your weight vector like um, like the normal of some hyperplane. Yes, it is. And then you project, and it's either above or below the hyperplane. A exactly that. Okay. In, in fact, say you have some points like this. <coughs> in a very <coughs> trivial way, if I ask you to separate the pluses and the minuses, you will cut the space into two. And that's what a linear classifier is doing. So you have a, this is a linear classifier in two dimensions. There is a bias plus w1 x1 plus w2 x2. And that clearly, this whole thing represents a line. Setting that to zero gives you a line. And if you go to n dimensions, in two dimensions you call it a line, in three dimensions you call it a plane. In n dimensions, it's a hyperplane. All it does is you have some space, and this object here in this line, or hyperplane, slices this place in, the space into two parts. We have two labels, we have two parts. How convenient. 
call one of them plus, call the other one minus. That's what's going on here. You have sliced this, in this case, the plane into two parts, and the normal to this line points towards the positive side. That's the same as this one. Ooh, that's cool. And we don't care about the magnitude of this dot product of this thing, but we only care about the sign. Is the geometric interpretation okay? Does it make sense? In two dimensions at least. I have some points, I'm going to draw a line and I'm going to say that one side of it is positive, the other side is negative, and now the learning problem is very clear, find the line. In n dimensions, the line is called a hyperplane. So in two dimensions it's a line, in three dimensions it's a plane, in n dimensions it's a hyperplane. In n dimensions anything becomes a hyper something. So a circle, a sphere becomes a hyper sphere. So th th that's the, this is the kind of picture I will draw all the time when I'm talking about the geometry of uh, linear classifiers. And this is a kind of intuitive, uh, uh, this is intuitive in the sense that you cut the space into two parts and you need to find the object that cuts the space. Questions about uh, what linear classifiers are? We will be looking at linear classifiers very closely for quite some time, so you need to get comfortable with this. <coughs> yes? Can you try projection? Which part of this is projection? So when a new example comes in, I have this no the normal here, right? This, this line here represents the normal to this plane. And I'm projecting the new example on this and looking at is this projection positive or in this case mm -hmm. it's negative. Oh, so you're projecting the normal? Yes. So the positive output is restricted to Yeah, it's binary classification. It, uh, it, yes, that's right. It's, this is, it's a linear classifier. <coughs> Another picture that you will often see with linear classifiers is something that looks like this. You have features, and this is the neural network version of a linear classifier. You have features, and they're all fed into this big summation unit, and there are weights along these wires. They are all added up, and then this is fed into a threshold, and then one more thing that's added is the bias, which is always one, and this is a bias, so these two are multiplied, and this is fed into a threshold to give a plus or a minus. Uh, this picture is often associated with the neural network universe, and this box here is often called a neuron. It's called a, it's called a linear threshold unit. You have a linear part and a threshold part. Yes. So can you have a bias in each uh, direction or each? You have one bias because it's one bias. In from the geometry point of view, in fact, we'll talk about what is the importance of the bias. From the geometry, if I change the bias, I'm basically moving this line. It's the intercept. It's the intercept of this line. You're changing. You're basically moving this line along this thing. And sometimes, actually, not sometimes, always the uh, it's important to have the bias feature, the bias uh, thing, because otherwise you are only considering lines that go through the origin. <coughs> yes? Uh, linear classifiers always classify in two bases, right? Like binary classification or you can have multiple... There are extensions of linear classifiers to multi-class. There are extensions of linear classifiers for graph value outputs, which are called structures. Uh, but the basic, uh, the basic uh, math of it is what is exactly the same. Uh, there are some cute uh, projection tricks that will take the outputs that we, you know, multi-class and structures and such things <coughs> and force them into this binary sort of a picture. Yes? Why the bias is always 
Oh, the bias is not one. I mean the B part. Usually we keep it as one and the uh, inside two we write. Initialize the B values as one. Why? Where? where? Um, in the next slide, you should. Oh, that, that no, I uh, right. That that was just because it was a uh, that was the drawing I made, right? It's a imagine instead of thinking of the bias as let uh, let me erase everything here. Instead of thinking of the bias being a constant that is added to everything. Another way I can think about it is, you know, you have these two features, right? X1 and X2. I'm going to introduce a new feature called X0. <coughs> X0 is always equal to 1. And then I'm going to rewrite this as B times X0 plus W1 X1 plus W2 X2. And X0 is always 1. This is convenient because this is a dot product. I just, by adding a new feature, which is always constant, I have gain the ability to have a bias. And that's exactly what we will be doing uh, in a bit. I, I, I'm talking about the bias now, but then very quickly I'll say that using this trick, we'll pretend that there is no bias. Right, but I, I'll mention that again in a bit. So, it's nice to have a class of functions. You know, I can come up with a class of functions as well. Why, why are these class of, these, this class of functions? functions interesting. Why are these functions interesting? So, in order to answer that question, you should ask yourself, what Boolean functions or what kinds of uh, concepts can linear classifier express? It turns out, linear classifiers are actually a very expressive hypothesis space. Many, many Boolean functions are linearly separable. Linear separ linearly separable means there exists a plane or a hyperplane that can spread the positives from the negatives. Many Boolean functions are linearly separable, but not all. Not all functions are linearly separable, and this is important. I'll show you an example in a bit. On the other hand, every Boolean function could have been represented by decision trees. So, linear classifiers represent a smaller set of functions. To give you an example, you have this conjunction, x1. By the way, uh, if anyone here is not from a computer science lineage, uh, this symbol might seem a little weird. This is just and. x1 and x2 and x3 um, is exactly the same as this threshold function. By the way, this is, exact, this is the same as saying the bias is minus 3 and then w1 w2 and w3 <coughs> are equal to 1. So you get b plus so this is exactly the same as this. Right? Now, what I'm arguing is that this linear threshold unit represents the conjunction. In order to see how that works, the easiest way of doing that is to just draw the truth table out. So you have this truth table for all conjunctions, you know, for the conjunction. Let's compare it to the linear threshold unit and its sign. The value of the, the function is here and, you know, magically this agrees with this. So these two functions are identical. Notice, by the way, I used minus 1 for, a uh, 0 for false, not minus 1, just to make this slide look prettier. Yes? So do we always consider 0 to be a positive number? Yes. By the, the default, we assume that 0 is... Uh, this, the sine function is defined to be that way. Okay. Sine of x is 1 if x is greater than or equal to 0. It's uh, actually the list, it's called the signal. So, yes? Um, that's the two columns are not the same. Do we then adjust the bias? No, you then have to figure out a different function. Uh, this is not the way to discover these functions. If you're going to try to do this, then it's going to be a little tedious. And in your homework, I'm asking you to do this, and I understand it's a little tedious. Um, mostly to kind of build character. <laughs> but there is a trick. There's a trick for this. Conjunctions are actually particularly easy because, notice, that I have x1 plus x and x2 and x3. They can all be zeros or ones, right? What is a conjunction? A conjunction is a function that says one 
if all of them are one, which means if they are all added up, there should be more than three of them for the output to be one. There should be at least three of them for the output to be one. Right? So that's the definition of a conjunction. Negations are also easy because all you have to do is replace this let, x3 is negated here, right? So I have x1 plus x2 plus x3 is negated. So 1 minus x3 is greater than or equal to 3. But that gives you this thing. So you replace anything that you, is negated with 1 minus that. So if you have a Boolean function and that's just a simple conjunction with either maybe negations or maybe not, then it's often, it's actually easy to convert it to a linear threshold. Disjunctions are also easy with the same kind of reasoning. What is a disjunction? A disjunction is a set of booleans that are connected by an OR. This is true, OR, this is true, OR, this is true, then the output is 1. And if you add them up, it should be greater than or equal to 1, right? If at even one of them is true, the output is 1. So that gives you a linear threshold. In fact, both of these are generalized. Uh, Okay, I've already given you the answer for the this junction here, but I encourage you to try out a little variant with a negation in the mix using a similar sort of a constructive mechanism. Now, actually, I'm going to go quickly past conjunctions and disjunctions and go to M of N functions because these generalize both conjunctions and disjunctions. Remember that an M of N rule is there are a fixed set of N Boolean, uh, Boolean features, it may be a subset of the total number of uh, Booleans out there. And the output is true if at least m of them are true. So the output is true, and in this case, at least if two of them, two of these three things are true. And an exercise for you, and I want you to work through this because it's actually fast. You will realize this faster than me telling you. Uh, oh. Okay, I've already told you. <laughs> uh, prove to yourself that this answer is correct. If at least two of them, two of these three things are true, then the output is uh, 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 one. These two functions are identical. And I want you to prove it both using a truth table and without using a truth table just by reasoning it out. And you can come up with questions on this uh, in the next <coughs> draft if you want. It turns out not all Boolean functions are linearly separable. And this is something that you should know and internalize. The classic example of this is the parity function, or the XOR function, or a picture that looks like this. You can't draw a line that separates out the pluses and the minuses. Right? So, now why is this a problem? This is actually historically a very interesting thing. Linear threshold units have been around for a very long time. In the 19, late 1950s, early 60s, mid 60s, they became the rage. I mean, you could not get go to a party without talking about linear threshold units. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> a certain kind of a party. <laughs> the point is, they became the rage. In fact, they were even featured on New York Times. Like the dawn of the machine age is here. Uh, the, uh, Machines are going to take over. They didn't call them machines, they call them AI. AI is going to take over. Uh, this might seem familiar because we are seeing those kinds of articles again in the news. Then in 1969 or 68, a book was uh, Marvin Minsky wrote and uh, Minsky and Papert, uh, have a, they wrote a book called Perceptrons, where they pointed out, oh, you know what, linear threshold units are so amazing. Here are all the geometric properties of linear threshold units. Here's what they can be. You can represent with them, here's what you cannot represent with them. Oh, by the way, you can't represent parity. You cannot represent XOR. And they gave the thing. And again, the New York Times kind of crowd took it. You can't even do parity. This is such a horrible class of functions. You can't do anything useful with it. AI is dead and the left. Uh, <laughs> and that, that was the first AI vendor. Uh, since then, there was a second AI vendor in the 80s, and now we are in the AI's, what is it, spring now. Uh, so, who knows what's going to happen. The point is, you cannot represent parity functions, and in fact, there are, it's easy to come up with many functions that are not linearly separate. And it's important to remember that. Linear threshold units are a strict subset of a set of all Boolean functions. And in this case, it's not Boolean, you know, I cannot, 
this is this here x1 and x2 are not just booleans this is your classic uh, xor function parity cannot be represented by linear threshold units and actually many non trivial boolean functions cannot be represented as an exercise i encourage you to look at this function here it's not linear in the four units in the four uh, features that we have yes That's pretty much what we need to do. We can do that, or we can go to a non-linear function. And in fact, having two linear functions and combining them will give you a non-linear function. And that, by the way, is called a multi-layer neural network. In this case, a two-layer neural network. Was there another question somewhere here? I saw half a hand, or maybe I just saw someone move. Okay. Are there other questions? So, stare at this Boolean function and convince yourself it's not linear. If you want to actually get an idea for why parity is not linear, you can draw this picture where you have, you know, pluses and uh, plus one is uh, true and minus one is false. So you have you have this is one comma one, this is one comma minus one, and so on. And the parity function will say the number. This is a plus, and this is a plus. This is a minus, and this is a minus. So you can't draw a line for this. But it turns out, even though linear functions, you know, many functions are not linearly separable, there is a very nifty trick, and this is one of the coolest machine learning tricks out there uh, that we will see much later. Uh, you can take a function that's not linear and change the representation. If I give you, you change, you know, this is one of the standard problems that we uh, you know, see in research and in life. If I ask you a question, you don't answer the question, you just change the question and give me an answer to the question that you want. <laughs> Here is an example of a one dimensional data set that is not linearly separable via one dimensional line. What is a one dimensional line? A line. Point. A point. point. You cannot put a point here and say that everything to the left or everything to one side is the same color. There is no such point. And the trick here is to change the representation. If you have a one dimensional data set, you use something called feature conjunctions. You project all points to this two dimensional space, x, comma, x square. Every point x becomes a two dimensional point, which is x, comma, x square, which raises all the points to the plane. And now, you can draw that. Okay. That's a neat trick. This is called uh, blowing up the feature space. You have no idea how long I took to make that. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing is, the data is linearly separate in this space. And just to give an example, you, your original input was this point minus 2, and now it's become minus 2 minus 2. And the question becomes, how do you know how to blow up the feature space? Now, I've, I've given you a new tool. You don't know how to use it because maybe why, why not x, x cubed? Why not x, x squared, x cubed? Why not x and sin x? Again, that's a design decision. And this is part of the feature exploration that we have to do. Yes. So is it kind of like normalization? It is, normalization is another feature. Uh, normalization is often a linear transformation because it's just translation and rotation. Here we are actually changing the basis function. We are going to a new space. Uh, in normalization is often in, not always but often in the same space. You're just moving all the points and rotating them so that they are inside like a, a, a certain region. Here we are doing more than that. So but by doing this, do you is there a possibility of adding artificial features or... Yes, we will, again, we are running the same risk. We might be adding, adding information that does not exist. Yes, that's always the risk. And that is the tension that we have to always live with when we are doing machine learning. By adding a new feature but, or by tweaking some features in a certain way, we might be biasing the whole learning framework to go towards a class of functions or to go towards the noise in the data. Because we might ourselves be confusing the noise for the signal. And 
That's a risk. That's a tension that we have to live with always. Okay, so I want you to use this, invent a feature transformation that takes the XOR data. Remember, XOR was already in two dimensions. I want you to invent a feature transformation that takes the XOR data and uh, makes it linearly separable. Try this as an exercise. Uh, the reason, and I encourage you to try this exercise because uh, it will kind of force you to either understand feature transformation or come to terms with the fact that you don't really understand it. <coughs> either way, that's a good uh, outcome and we can talk about it. There's another aspect, the reason why linear classifiers are useful. Many, many times, data is not linearly separable, but almost linearly separable. And this is especially true in extremely high dimensions. In fact, you will see, you will see a sentence like this thrown around uh, sometimes. Any data is linearly separable in high enough dimensions. If you don't understand yet what that means, think of the kinds of feature transformations. You can take, make feature transformations and you know, just basically points are typically far away from each other in high dimensions and just draw the line. Even when it's not linearly separable, you can get data that almost linearly separable and pretend that things that are on the wrong side of the line are actually nice. And then the decision that we have to make is how much such noise are we willing to allow? And that, be that becomes, and we'll formalize that and quantify that and provide, basically we look at a knob that we have, that tuning it on one side says that I'm not going to allow any noise and turning it on, I'm going to allow a bit more noise. And we'll see learning algorithms that come inbuilt with such uh, tuning mechanisms. Alright, so let me uh, wind up this uh, discussion on the expressiveness of linear classifiers and talk about uh, regression, start the next lecture with regression. So, linear classifiers are an expressive hypothesis class. Many functions are linear. They functions that are Boolean, many of them are linear, and it's often a good guess for the hypo a hypothesis space just for that reason. But even functions that are not linear, uh, so actually there are functions that are not linear, and it's important to know and recognize this. The classic example for nonlinear functions uh, is the XOR example. In fact, XOR is often like the standard uh, poster child for a bad behaving function in machine learning. It often comes up as a counter example. But even these functions can be made linear by taking them to a higher dimensional space. And that's a trick that we will use. And the reason for, uh, oh, I'll start with this in the next class, but the, this is the reason we it's often good to study linear alg uh, you know, algorithms for uh, linear classifiers, understand what the geometry is, because even if functions are not linear, they can be made linear, even many functions are linear, and so by just focusing on this class of functions, we can now analyze it to depth and come up with many, many learning algorithms. I'll start the next lecture with a discussion of why we need the bias to answer a question that we had earlier. I've already answered it, but I'll start with that again. Uh, for those of you who came in late, uh, there was a whole discussion on projects. I encourage you to you know, ask people and find out. And there's a homework that you should start if you haven't already.